welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, I think we have a few. We have a few more who'll be uh, making their way through, but we'll get started. Uh, so, welcome to this series of talks, looking around the corner and around the world, an opportunity for us to share what we are learning out of the innovation in that most critical of challenges, local news media. It's part of the IPI Global Network's deep dive research into local news in our global journalism project. And this time we're asking, what happens when your readers become your owners? And uh, I'm gonna just pop, or, or we'll pop into the chat box now, the report that we have, that we launched a couple of weeks ago. So you have the link for that. And that's full of insights and case studies, takeaways and recommendations. And then for a deeper dive into each of the news organisations that we've covered, we're publishing these on our Medium page. And you have the link to that as well. So, um, through cooperatives or community-based nonprofits, journalists and editors are testing this idea of what actually happens when you know, we put the readers in charge. And it turns out it means rethinking your journalism and your relationship with the audience and community by better aligning both the journalism and the business strategy around our audience. And now we're delighted to have three and perhaps four um, great journalism thinkers from pioneering news organisations. And these are some of the organisations that the IPI Global Network has been talking to that are making the digital transition work in their community with cooperatively owned news organisations. And it's, I know um, we have people from all continents with us this afternoon and, uh, and the same with our speakers, although one of our speakers is in the US and it could be that it's um, a little early because he hasn't managed to join. So I hope that he will join sometime through the hour because, um, it's Ohio's The Devil Strip, and it's really a fascinating, um, a, you know, a really fascinating news organisation. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I guess it's one of the challenges of hosting these events for a global audience is that, you know, we have, I'm um, coming to you from Sydney, you know, where it's, you know, after 10pm and for our US audience, it's, you know, very early in the morning. But thanks everybody for joining us, you know, for making that effort wherever you are with the time difference. Uh, so I'd like to welcome um, our speakers. We have Lucas Bat from UK's uh, Bristol Cable. So say hi, Lucas. Hi, great to be here. Um, and we have Pooja Pandey from India's Kabbalaharia. Hi, hi everyone. Happy to be here. Okay, and we're going to work through some questions to tease out how you know each of these news organisations are working. And a little later, we'll also we'll also bring in Daniela Agitu from La Ora del Police in in Italy, which is another one of the news organisations that we have covered for 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 this research. And we'll we'll work through as, as I say, you know, some we'll. Excuse me, what we're going to do is we're going to unpack, first of all, what the co-op structure is. And then we'll look at how the journalism, the products and the business model works. And if you have any, any comments or questions, drop them into the chat box, please. And, uh, and we'll, we'll either pick up the questions as we go or we'll certainly have time towards the end of the session that we'll leave particularly for, for those questions. Okay, so turning first to you, Lucas, and I guess what, what would be good to know is when did the Bristol Cable first come to the idea of empowering readers through a co-op? How does it work? Um, the idea was first um, uh, thought of by the uh, co-founders, Adam, Alon and Alec, um, while really um, kind of had graduated university and were thinking of what to do with their lives very much, but wanted to do something important and powerful and saw um, how, how local media was 
just not working in any in, in any way that looked uh, like it was serving communities and saw that was a, a real opportunity to do something um, to, to make a difference in the world there uh, for 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 local communities um, and um, hit upon the idea that uh, running a media organization as a cooperative uh, might provide a foundation that would answer a lot of the, the kind of concerns that they identified. So um, the business model of local media in the UK um, just didn't seem to be working, relying on advertising and print sales falling and the online approach to um, uh, funding uh, media ended up a race at the bottom with kind of clickbait based articles. And that was basically contributing to further destroying trust uh, between readers and news organizations. So really having a wholesale rethink about how do we fund local media and re re or re sorry, reorientate our relationship uh, back to, um, to the citizens uh, that the, uh, uh, are concerned with the local newspaper. Um, so this began um, when they kind of moved to Bristol, um, consulting with local people at, and really just starting from the basics of um, what do people want, talking to local people, talking to um, community leaders and people who run charities and part of universities to see um, what they needed and wanted out of it. And from that basically built um, kind of a movement as well as some principles for um, the new, what was they were setting upon was a, a new kind of news organization. Um, and managed to get some crowdfunding um, to uh, focus on putting out just one newspaper to, to make it real uh, and, and to, to prove a new way of doing things. Um, and so that, that created a community from the beginning around the idea of a, of a new, new news organization. Um, and um, from there grow the cooperative. So um, uh, people, those people became founding members, a lot of the people who we had first kind of consultative chats with. Um, and um, it was a grassroots unpaid voluntary team for quite a few years. Um, but um, we've grown our membership and become a kind of a more professionalized uh, uh, institution now um, uh, with paid members of staff and 2,600 members. Um, and just to give more kind of background, mm -hmm. so that's the kind of how we were born sort of story a little bit. And it's been quite a journey for sure. Um, uh, but we were very much, yeah, born in the idea of like um, communities need to be a part of the the, the organization, a part of the the newspaper um, uh, that the newspaper is trying to serve that community. So, so um, uh, the cooperative structure in the cable is uh, members are legal share shareholders. So, uh, it's from little as one pound a month that um, someone can be a member. Um, but it's a pay what you want model. So um, that's really a, the idea that we don't want to exclude anyone. Um, the cooperative model means that we can never be bought or sold. So one of the problems that we identified was um, big capital um, was basically buying up local newspapers and then consolidating and shutting them down. Uh, and this meant that we could establish a, news or a newspaper as a as kind of community infrastructure, um, like a community asset uh, that uh, just um, the structure means that it can't go away. Um, and how members are involved has definitely evolved over time as we've kind of grown. So those kind of founding meetings became monthly members meetings where we really talked as a group about um, what our policies would be, what's our ethical advertising charter, because we have advertising in the, in the print product. Um, who can become a member? Can organizations become members? Um, should we publish articles written um, or, or even speak to uh, people that we might be concerned about having a platform? Um, so really trying to get um, a perspective and, and shape the values of the organization um, through the insight of members. Um, but obviously, as we've grown over time, those kind of uh, weekly and then monthly meetings became a space which weren't as democratic as they could have been um, because not everyone can make it down to those spaces. So we had to move our engagement online um, while also keeping our events and pivoting our events to be more, more about um, showing what we've been doing and have people feed in on specific topics. So I can, I'm happy to talk more about that in terms of what we do uh, mm -hmm. at the moment, but uh, that's a general overview of um, how the cable came about and uh, what the models are all about. Okay, so, so, so with one pound, you become an owner. 
Is that you're a member? You're also a, a, an owner, one of the two thousand six hundred owners. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and 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 just to give you some context, because um, Chris Horn isn't here from Devil Strip. They they are slightly different. They they have a membership that that is paid, and it's only once you reach three hundred thirty US dollars that that has been paid that you actually become an owner, if you like, one of the um, you know eligible to be elected to the board and things like that. So how does that structure work? You've got twenty six hundred members. Who who's actually the publisher? Well. And um... how decides yeah okay um so um so you remember if you uh, keep up your membership dues you have to contribute every month or you can pay annually so it's a kind of um it relies on that rolling um subscription um we have directors so uh, members elect directors at our annual general meeting and our, our agm is our kind of one of our biggest um uh, decision making forums and a part of our democratic structure um, and the directors are all drawn from uh, the membership and they are um, the, the board which are um, hold the, the staff team accountable, um, but they also provide expertise and advice as well. So that's, an, that's a big part of the, um, the democratic structure. Um, but members also um, are sort of more of a, like an everyday part of our organization. So there's the sense in which we are always accountable to them. So if we do something um, that members might not be happy with, we will get immediate feedback for people emailing us or canceling their subscriptions. So that's that's a, a way in which the structure, it doesn't rely on democratic institutions, it's immediate feedback um, in which we are accountable to them because we rely on them for our, our revenue. Um, uh, yeah, so that's, that's, a, that's kind of overview of that. Okay, and and co-ops are co-ops are really about serving the members, right? But I know we've had a conversation about how do you how do you kind of like actually serve the public interest? How do you switch that? So so yeah, legally we're registered as a cooperative and a community benefit society as well. So um, cooperatives, yes, they're meant to serve the interests of uh, the members. But written into our constitution is that the interests of members and the interest of the organisation is the interest of everyone who lives in Bristol. Um, so uh, that is the, the ethos of our organization and why people join to become members. So um, we, members, it's, 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 yeah, it's a bit of a tension that members um, uh, support us and join the organization to make uh, what we do free for everyone else and to include everyone else. So we, we have no paywall, it's not a subscription. Um, it's, it's a public benefit that members are supporting. Um, so um, that's, that's how we pitch our membership is, is that um, uh, people know that's what they're supporting. They're supporting quality, independent journalism, investigative journalism, journalism which highlights the voices of marginalized people, uh, journalism that engages with communities. And uh, so, yeah, that's an interesting thing for us. And I'm always thinking about what kind of benefits do we give exclusively to, exclusively to members so mm -hmm. that they feel they're getting uh, real value, um, a unique value. Um, they, they lose something if they cancel um, versus uh, how we're making sure we're not excluding people in the city because we don't want to exclude people. We want basically membership to make uh, our journalism as accessible um, to anyone in the city. And, and that's what membership is for. Okay, and, and it's, a, it's one pound to be a member. It is what do you have to pay to have the magazine or the the paper delivered? Three pounds a month. So, so it's a pay what you want model, and we don't have any kind of tiers. We don't want to create differences between members, but we do recognise that it costs us money basically to send out uh, the magazine in the post. Um, right. So so we do so that, and three pounds is our most yeah. common subscription. The average people who sign up is about nearing four pounds at the moment, actually. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, great. And Pooja, tell us about Kabbalaharia, which is, I know I'm not pronouncing that properly, but you'll correct me. Um, but I, I like it's it's quite a different model, still very much uh, you know, rooted in the community. And it's it's more a kind of a co-op of women journalists, right? How tell us how it's different. Yeah, so how it's it works. Not a, uh, yeah. Hi, Jackie. 
Thank you. So it's not a co-op in the in the technical sense, like Lucas explained how they're registered as a co-op. So in fact, when you first uh, 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 asked me for this, I went and looked at Bristol Cable and Instagram. I was like, okay, that's not who we are. And then I realized what you meant by you know kind of community ownership. So yeah. So just a little bit about Khabar Leheria, and that that's fine how you said it. It's news waves. You can prefer to call it that. That's what it translates as. Uh, so Khabar Leheria is a print newspaper turned. Uh, recently turned uh, digital first news platform and YouTube first run by uh, people of marginalized communities. So marginalized on uh, the basis of gender, which I guess is global and people can relate to that and caste, which is very specific to India uh, and runs out of rural, the rural Northern hinterland. So that's like just in to sum up what Khabar Laheria is. It's hyper local and grassroots journalism uh, sort of off by four the community. Uh, since we've gone digital, it's um, expanded a little more state-wise and into other states. Uh, when it was a newspaper, it was a bit slightly more hyper-local, I, I would say. Um, so um, it's it's community. Um, in fact, when Lucas was talking, I was thinking it's there's so many things that are different, so many things that are same. I feel like the fact that the community um, literally owns it in, in that sense is something that uh, isn't true about Khabar Laheria. Uh, uh, and yet, uh, you know, you can argue that uh, since since the people who run it are from the communities and they have ownership uh, in every sense of the word, then, you know, it is it is community owned. Um, I would say that they're more like now, so Khabar Laheria now is, it started in 2002. And so now it's, it's, that, it's almost like uh, 20 years old now. Uh, so, it's uh, the, the women who run it now are sort of like the leaders of the communities. And this is something that has happened over time. It started with the roots are in an adult literacy program for women uh, that was run. And uh, it was uh, at the end of that program, the women uh, thought, you know, what, what next? And it was really about uh, what do we do with now having learned literacy and uh, what is the need now? So in terms of responding to the community need, I feel I feel like it was a burning need within them more than responding to something that was external. So as women in this landscape where they now had the tools to kind of, you know, because of the program uh, and had and gained literacy, uh, what what is the need that they felt? What is it that they could they could do and um, they, they could document, right? And they could make news. And this was um, a disruptive idea at the time. I mean, kind of still is. Uh, because for women in that landscape and from lower, so-called lower castes of the communities, it's um, uh, they're not seen on the media landscape. To date, they're not seen on the media landscape where we are. Um, so uh, that was like the burning need and that was like the ownership to disrupt that model, that the, ma that the newsmaker had to be a man, had to be, uh, had to have some kind of a, you know, ed formal educational background, things that we're told are, are what give you jobs and has to be from a certain caste or a class to be able to be there. So, so in that sense, I think it's, it's community owned, but the model itself is very different and it's actually gone through a huge transition recently. Um, it was uh, housed in a not-for-profit trust for the longest time of its life. And uh, recently in the past few years, uh, Kabbalah area has moved to a media company. So uh, uh, a for-profit media company. So the model today is, is that we are very much um, a business uh, enterprise and uh, yeah, figuring out what it means to be a feminist business media house that is intersectional and diverse. I mean, you know, I'm speaking at this forum today for various reasons, but, and Jackie and I spoke about this a little bit when she first asked me, but uh, I often say I'm like the diversity quota at, at Khabar Lahiria, and I only say it half jokingly, half yeah. seriously, because it's actually the women from the communities, the rural Dalit women who are running uh, who are running the show, who are making the decisions, who are leading projects and all of that. Uh, so, so yeah, so I think that's where we're trying to um, continue that disruptive model of Khabar Lahiria, which is kind of like the root and the impulse and the DNA of how can we disrupt it now in the larger media landscape, which is beyond news and gets into culture, gets into shaping narratives, um, gets into uh, policy discussions. Are there ways that we can do that now and on a broader scale? I think I'll pause here for... Jackie, you're muted. Jackie, you're... 
So I am. Uh, yeah, you talk about that you, you know, that, that Kabbalah Lahair is, is really disrupting journalism, well, certainly journalism as it, as it was in northern India and much of India, I'm guessing. And, um, you know, and, and you've really kind of rethought also, you know, what journalism is and what a journalist is. And so a lot of that work has been about bringing that kind of diversity. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about the investment that that takes. I mean, how do you get there? Um, the diversity? Yeah. I mean, we, we've, uh, yeah. I, I remember we talked before in, in an interview about, um, you know, the kind of training that goes into, you know, into the, and it's ongoing. Yeah, absolutely. I think there are a couple of things there. One is just the training in terms of journalism and what can we call it, digital literacy and, and the tools that are needed for that, right? So there is just that training because there is a language that the media or, or let's say the journalism landscape works with. The Indian digital news media has, has really exploded, although in the past few years, it's also really imploded, I suppose. Um, but uh, so there are certain tools and certain languages that are, you know, platform related that one has to know and one has to learn, right? And so access to that, I suppose, is something that does come yeah. from more of the urban centers. It does come from all the privilege and entitlement that, 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 we are, that we're familiar with, that I would say I'm a product of as well. So I think that that's the kind of um, traffic that comes from there. Um, but I would say that the, uh, uh, the, the, the other way, it's, it's like a, not even a two-way street, maybe multiple way streets, but just to keep it simple, I would say a two-way street. That the kind of training and learning that that comes from uh, from from the from the rural women for say for say somebody like me, uh, two or three of us say in Delhi who 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 are involved in certain other aspects of the business, so to speak, uh, is um, is also something that's not been documented. I feel, and that's why I'm saying disruptive uh, as the DNA. Uh, it's something that we are now trying to kind of track and map as a as as our own kind of passion project. Uh, but what are the things to learn? So you know there is like a one size fits all model, right, which works for digital media and news, um, and in India as well. Uh, even if there is rural reporting, uh, it it kind of fits a certain parameter that you know somebody from there's something big that happens. It's a drought. It's a flood. It's an election. Something like that. And then you know somebody from the newsroom in Delhi or Bombay or wherever goes into uh, the hinterlands and kind of does their reporting and comes back and there's been like amazing reporting that has happened uh, in that way for sure uh, but uh, you know locally it's called uh, helicopter reporting where we are which is you know somebody just choppers in and then choppers out uh, it's, it's a very different perspective or a viewpoint when you live there when you belong there when those uh, issues that are being talked about in say an election in say a political leader's speech are actually the issues that affect you on a day-to-day -day basis and then if you had the power to make a story about that, to report it, to document it, and then, you know, with your credibility as Khabar Lahiriya today, we're lucky and we worked on it to be very credible locally and nationally, then you know you'll be heard. So um, I think that that's, that's, those are the things that we're kind of trying to, I think, still map even for ourselves. And we're trying to document it for, for the larger kind of consumption. But when you talk about Training, I just wanted to respond to it in that way, that there's like a formal training, which of course is, is very, very precious to Kabbalah uh, area. And there is, there is this kind of everyday learning and everyday uh, uh, communication that, you know, the, the sisterhood, so to speak, is, is involved in. Uh, and now I feel very, very mindfully. I think so far it's happened uh, just because you're hanging out together. But now I think we're doing it a little more mindfully now that we're a business, I suppose. Okay, great. And and Lucas, like if the if the members are the owners or the the kind of, you know managers, if you like, I mean, how much can you actually expect them to be involved in the in the work of Bristol Cable? And and how do you, how do you approach that? How do you like what do you get from them? That's a good question. I think. Um what does it mean or what should it mean to own a local newspaper is a question that I think about quite a lot and something that um, is an open developing question um, but it's a question that we're trying to answer with members um, so there is a formal way in which members have power written in the constitution 
um, and the, the way they can raise agenda items at the AGM and things like that. But more practically, there's the, the culture of the way in which people interact and the way in which um, we invite members to interact, um, which is not constitutional, but based on um, what we feel like we owe members and what um, and how we see members as a vital part of um, improving our journalism. So um, very much, I think, at the moment, what it means to be a member is you're a part of something. It's an identity. It's it's a um, it's a feeling of support of being yeah being part of something. Um, so I think for for many members, and when we've um, we've uh, talked with members, we're always getting feedback. We're always asking, um, and we've also done specific research projects of like how do you feel in your relationship and what kind of what do you want to do as a member? What kind of a say do you want to have? Um, many or most simply just want to support the organization um, and um, are very happy that the engagement happens, that people are asked to participate or that we are going to communities. Um, so I think that's one of the interesting tensions that we try to navigate is not expecting too much, I think, or, or not burdening people. You know, sometimes we will get emails saying, uh, what's my legal liability for being a member? You know, it's one one pound. There's no nothing on you really. Um, or um, people cancelling, saying I feel like I haven't got time to contribute, um, etc. And I think we don't want people feeling um, put off. I think or feeling like there's a big expectation. I think it's more of an invitation. Um, we've asked members specifically about this, and I think one of the important things about the model is it it makes us challenge the relationship we have with uh, what would be called the audience or rather the community that we're a part of um, because of that relationship that we need to nurture with that community. Um, so that really, it relies on us to be in touch with um, what people want, uh, or what people expect, how they're interacting with us. Um, so we have asked these questions, um, for example, at the AGM a couple of years ago, um, we would just put directly the question, what, what decisions do you want to be involved in? And um, we also don't just throw things out at people. We also at the same time really recognize that people can't make informed decisions without uh, the right information, without the right kind of framing, without the headspace to do it. So, so our AGMs, we, we really make sure that we uh, give people as much information as possible beforehand and we also introduce things very well and facilitate conversations you know it'll be for example six to eight people around a table with a big worksheet and like stickers and uh, things that they can interact with and directly talk with the people around them and give them 15 minutes to discuss and feedback after that mm -hmm. um, and the conclusion of for example that particular decision uh, of like what kind of decisions do you want to be involved with is um not everything, um, or, or not the day to day. Uh, I think, as, as someone directly put it, we trust the staff team to take those decisions because we don't have the time or information to make those operational decisions. But if there's something which you feel like is going to change what the organization is about, if it's going to change uh, the kind of values that we feel like it stands for, or the kind of or the value that we think it provides to the community, um, then ask us about it. Um, so from that, I think we've grown from the very beginning. I think it's important also to think of like the organization in terms of its, its journey. It, it doesn't always make sense to be one thing at every point. And I think at the beginning, it was really building up uh, a relationship with, um, with people, with communities, um, and also with them shaping our values and shaping what the organization is. And, um, that early kind of startup phase um, formed the foundations of a kind of our values and the way in which we relate with communities. Um, and now I think there's only so many decisions you can make at the um, make about policy, et cetera. And then, um, then it's kind of checking in with things. And so for the first couple of years, we're really engaging with members um, to help set, uh, figure out what we're all about, what we want to be like. Um, and now, um, our AGM is the biggest uh, engagement platform that we, we use with members. Wow. And then it's really a kind of a, a sense check. Uh, for example, our last AGM, we held it online for the first time in October. And that was really about um, 
the main engagement uh, uh, decision we had there was it was actually just visioning like what do you want the cable to be in five years and we were exploring that together in, in facilitated conversations to uh, to draw on the kind of the inspiration and aspirations that members have for the organization but it was also important for us to check with members uh, what they want us to be doing in terms of informing our strategy and our roadmap so yeah I, I think our relationship with members has evolved over time and certainly now it's at scale it really requires quite different approaches in terms of um, inviting people without pressure um, so we do um, what we call them call outs for example so um, uh, that's kind of sending out an email with a link to a call to action with, with a with a form basically with like uh, questions that we spend quite a lot of time thinking about framing and giving the right information so people can feed in um, quite a lot of like open ended questions but um, but really tested and framed in a way that people can give the most um, useful information and is, is respecting their time. Uh, and then we, we spend a lot of time analyzing that information. And one example of that is uh, we had local elections recently, actually um, two weeks ago. And on the in the run up to that, um, we ran a citizens agenda project. So um, that's something um, that uh, Jay Rosen from New York University has been a big advocate of, uh, as well as membership puzzle and Harkin. Yeah. And so we're drawing on, on um, uh, that as a kind of um, product or a, a model for doing audience engagement uh, with election coverage. And um, that, that was a really a, a large scale um, push in terms of engaging our members and our wider audience in asking them, what issues do you care about this election, basically? Um, and, and what questions would you ask politicians? And synthesizing all of that into eight points of the top priorities for people. And we use that to inform uh, editorial priorities. We use that to inform the stories that we covered. And we also um, uh, uh, use that to ask questions to candidates as well, um, just to, to recenter communities uh, in um, our editorial priorities and our coverage and in the debate around um, the election. Okay. Um, and uh, Pooja, Tell, tell us about the journalism mission of Cover Laharia. I mean, what what kind of stories do you cover? Who are the journalists? Do you know what what other stories that you that you tell? Um, yeah, so the stories that we tell are hyper local and grassroots. And since uh, the reporters are from the community, they are the ones that are that are most pertinent to community. Having said that, we're uh, uh, now a digital and YouTube first first platform and uh, anything that if you think of kind of you know the classic kind of local news model in in the time when you know there was uh, local news feed would actually feed into say say a national or a central model um, we do all of that so um, there's culture so there's a lot of there's vibrant heritage music dance where we are in Uttar Pradesh and Bundelkhand so there's that um, and and uh, there's something we do uh, where we do feel good youth stories inspiring stories uh, we call them local heroes uh, so we kind of do do all of that i would say our um, emphasis is is since we're feminist in nature and and the very foundation is feminist it's about underrepresented voices and underprivileged communities uh, the focus is feminist issues so where we are it's it's a lot of uh, issues around uh, violence against women uh, and it's a lot of issues around caste-based violence and caste-based prejudices. Um, again, going back to what I said about those two being like the biggest kind of determinants where we are in terms of privilege, caste and gender. Uh, but yeah, otherwise the feminist lent, lens across. So uh, for instance, we also do feminist humor. We do a show uh, which looks at ingrained patriarchal practices, but with like, you know, a wit and a sense of humor uh, when we're questioning them. Uh, going about it's literally a walk spot show where the reporter asks people uh, something very very basic like you know um, uh, like there are a lot of fasts that women keep for instance and they do it for the long lives of their husbands or their sons or whatever it's very very patriarchal ritual so she'll just go about asking fun questions like that uh, uh, but kind of you know planting the seed of I would say some kind of inception, feminist inception of, you know, questioning the very practice mm. uh, as, you know, um, um, if it's about long life, would he do it for you? Has he ever done it for you? And uh, things like that. So that's just one example, but done in kind of like a fun way. 
uh but yeah so like any kind of i would say local news channel we cover everything that's happening that's happening over there since we've gone digital i think one of the big things that has kind of happened organically and strategically is that uh we map it to national issues and sometimes even global issues uh so whatever the national conversation is happening what is the ways that we can speak to those national conversations uh for people to be able to identify and align and often there there is a lot uh we anyway think that you know news that is happening in a village is as important as news that is happening in delhi uh and you know it's on us to kind of make that connection because people don't don't get it otherwise so how do you fill that fill that gap and internationally just as an example when me too happened uh um uh, and uh, me too india happened it was happening in a specific kind of circle it was happening in urban media practitioner circle and um we went back and thought about it you know how can we align with the me to movement so the stories from the ground can can also come out in this way it's a good time to kind of talk about it and uh, how do you then do that so then there's a lot of conversation around editorially packaging production etc uh, right now with the pandemic what's happening is the the second wave has hit rural india really really bad and uh, uh, again there's a gap in in mainstream news around what's actually happening in rural india because the first wave did not hit rural india that bad in terms of the virus in terms of illness and death there were other issues that happened but not illness and death as much so uh, what does it mean what is the rural reality of the second wave right now is is a big story right now that is completely missing from national media so actually we're doing that in fact that article is going to come out tomorrow so um, yeah as was i was as i was coming into this uh, i was thinking about about this story and how like the relevance and the importance of khabar lehria because you know you do need those local voices uh, to be able to feed into the national narrative because otherwise this kind of it's it's that one story that everybody gets and now with the algorithm bias we all know that we only see that one kind of story and uh, especially in india with rural and urban it's 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 huge the divide uh, so uh, it's so important that that local voice and those local realities and what's happening to the communities on the ground uh you know what is happening there to also appear in your in your twitter feeds and and in your um, yeah on on national fronts and in hopefully in policy discussions so so yeah that's that's the news So so I I want to come back and talk to you Lucas about the kind of journalism you do and how you have impact but I'd like to bring Daniela in now Daniela uh, Agitu from the La Ora del Policia and this it, it's a hyper local magazine that has a similar co-op model and and quite a different product because it's a it's a 200 page quarterly magazine um which is quite different to the online offering in between um but it was founded in 2016 by a non-profit cultural association which continues as its publisher it has 160 members and they're each paying i think $50 and um $50 each and they participate in board elections and they have an editorial vote and the the business model is um apart from the members it's the advertising native advertising it's um it's it's also content services and subscriptions and sales of the of the print edition so i just wanted to to daniel to to tell us a little bit about the the journalism mission because you it's, it's quite a young publication as well and you're you know you you've learned a lot over the time but but it's quite different so tell us about the journalism mission and how you cover the com- the issues of your community okay uh thank you jacky uh hi poja hi lucas uh, what greetings uh, to all sorry for my english uh, when uh, we conceived lora del pellice exactly 5 years ago we asked ourselves if it would be better to focus on online or on paper uh well i confess uh, we are fond of paper <laughs> so uh we chose the second option um aware of that uh, to be able to face the cost of the publication we would have to focus on the quality of the, our project product 
um, we felt that uh, in our small community, there could be a sufficient number of people willing to pay eight euros per quarter to buy our, our magazine. It's so, <laughs> um, well, to buy in-depth stories, uh, surveys, interviews, uh, historical analysis. Well, the big challenge, however, was to support our project on a non-profit cultural association, open to all those who recognize themselves in our values. <laughs> Four magic words, quality, community, independence, and respect. Our bet is that people who live here want to support us uh, because we change the, their lives a little bit. This is our idea of journalism. We, su we survive only if the people think we are useful. Initially, we were support through a crowdfunding campaign, then by the subscription of a card by the readers. In 2021, I hope, <laughs> we should reach uh, 170 members, a number that uh, has been grown year after year. Well, uh, they are not mere subscribers even if they receive the magazine at home, of course. They are real publishers. Uh, our members will elect the board. Uh, we have a, a weekly newsletter and at least twice uh, a year, we organize a meeting for the approval of the budget, of course, but mostly for the evaluation of the project undertaken. Um, uh, we listen to advice, suggestions and indications and so on. The journalists, of course, maintain uh, it, it, independence, which uh, for us is crucial, uh, but it would be absurd not to consider what our readers want to read, to read in Laura del Pellice. Uh, we are first and foremost a service magazine, so uh, we are available to our readers to explore issues and problems that they would like to understand better. Uh, for some time now, we have been combining the quarterly with the weekly online broadcast on our Facebook page and uh, YouTube channel, of course. Furthermore, as you mentioned, Jackie, uh, we finance ourselves by offering services to our community, by making our professional structure av available to companies and organizations. Our association, on the other hand, as among uh, it aims the promotion of the region to which it prefers. But this happens while we maintain a rigorous independence of the quarterly. This is an essential value for the, for the re readers themselves and the readers understood it perfectly. Is our model replicable? Well, uh, we believe so. If other magazines dedicated to small territories uh, recognize themselves in the same values, we could create a network or even a format. Why not? This would allow to exchange, uh, pardon, uh, sorry, we, this would allow the exchange of experience and professionalism and would help to create economies of scale. Um, in Italy, is born and is quite famous an organization called the Slow Food which promotes the culinary specialties of small places. Uh, well, we, we believe that a similar slow project can be born dedicated to quality community journalists. Thank you. <clears throat> Terrific. Thanks, Daniela. And um, we've actually just published a piece um, about Laura, which is Melissa's just put in the in the chat box if you want to check that out on our Medium page. And uh, so, so, so now, Lucas, to both you and actually um, Devil Strip, you know, have both talked about how you don't cover breaking news. Um, you don't, I think actually um, Chris talks about covering crime as an artifact of old media. So you don't cover you don't cover breaking news. Um, you're not really covering daily journalism. So what what kind of journalism do you do, Lucas? And what impact 
does it have? Like, what impact are you looking for? Impact is definitely the word that we, we talk about. Um, investigative journalism is something that we're known for. So holding power to account, being that force for sticking up for the city and uh, un understanding where corruption is or um, finding out problems in communities and helping to find solutions. So solutions journalism is definitely something we do as well. Highlighting marginalized voices, people really recognize and uh, value all of those things. Um, so I think we try to understand ourselves within the wider media context in the city of where do we fit in, um, that there are uh, two other um, major news organizations in the city that are doing daily news. Um, and also though, recognizing the limits of that and what do people need from us? So for example, recently in Bristol, there were some um, quite large protests um, about um, police and, and crime bill um, that would have banned um, protests in, in many people's eyes. Um, and we were, it was actually outside of our office actually quite <laughs> conveniently because it was held uh, next to the, um, the major police headquarters in the city. Um, but our journalists were there on the street um, uh, filming and, and reporting, live reporting. Um, and this is something I think we're, we're kind of thinking about what is our relationship with breaking news. And I think it's something about relevance. I think if we weren't there, it would have felt like uh, we should have been. Um, and these protests went uh, on for um, several days, over different days. Uh, they were um, turned into riots, the windows were smashed, cars set on fire. Um, but we were there for every moment of it. And it was something, interestingly, that the national media kind of didn't cover very well. But we got huge recognition for, for actually highlighting a narrative of that you only would have got if you were there, because the narrative from held in the national media was very much the narrative from the authorities, from the press release. Um, and the narrative what we were able to give was um, one we think is much um, truer to the events that happened. And this is quite interesting in that um, how that was cashed out in terms of membership growth. So first of all, we had a lot of existing members saying, emailing in and saying, um, thank you for your coverage. We were so glad to, you were there. Uh, so glad to be a part of this organization that is able to um, report fairly. Uh, and we also had um, hundreds of new members join, uh, really saying, um, I've been meaning to become a member for a long time, but this is the moment that I re you really showed how important it is to have um, free, fair uh, journalism uh, in the city and that people um, came out to support us for that. So um, we basically focus on things that we feel like people care about and that will matter to them. I think that there are things in which we might think about what are people's particular needs. So for example, over the last year, um, uh, I've been working with a colleague on a weekly newsletter um, completely focused on COVID basically, um, uh, recognizing that um, people's priorities had changed and their information needs had changed a lot. Uh, so we sensed that, but we also checked that. Uh, we asked uh, our general audience and members, what do you need from us? Uh, here are some things that we're thinking about doing. Um, and people very much wanted information about uh, how, how COVID is spreading through the city. Where is it bad? What can they do? Where can they find food or legal advice? And so we, we try to prioritize, I think, our coverage around what we, um, what we think people will matter to people, um, that people will find useful. And particularly during yeah. those priorities change so much. So it, it, it varies basically, but um, those are kind of the principles of like, what, what, what matters to people? Like nothing frivolous, like things that um, uh, make a difference to people's lives, things yeah. that people support. Okay. Now we, we're coming towards the end of the hour. So I just wondered, did anybody have any questions? Uh, for any of the, the speakers. I mean, actually, there I had hoped that we would cover a lot more, but there you go. There's there are three really interesting organisations. I guess um, my, where, my kind of questions now are, you know, first of all, is it sustainable? Like, I mean, where are we, you know, for, for each of you? How sustainable is the model? And 
you know, bearing in mind we only have like less than 10 minutes left, if you can each just maybe end on this note, something very briefly. And what advice do you have for others who might be thinking, you know, about how, you know, they love this kind of model and would like to start something similar or, or shift, you know, pivot to this kind of model? So I might start with you, Pooja. Sustainability is just just briefly, yes, please. Yeah, I think after impact, sustainability is like the other. Uh, but I also think they have a relationship. I think that if you are impactful and can show impact uh, in ways that you can redefine impact, I feel uh, is, is which is part of our learning journeys. Like Lucas mentioned with the protests and how that was learning journey for the Bristol Cable. I think that. Uh, if, if you can map the two, it works. So that's something that we are trying to do. And which is why I mentioned uh, getting into policy, you know, how, how can you start talking in a way that it, people in the policy rooms, because at the end of the day, they are the ones taking the decisions that affect people's lives and that, that use public money. How, how can you reach those spaces? So um, I think that that kind of impact also then translates into sustainability. Having said that, it's, it's always a challenge. Like I said, we were in a not-for-profit trust for the longest time and sustainability was one big reason why we decided to make the shift actually. Uh, because, um, you know, the trust was, it was a bit of a, you know, it, it was in the world of philanthropy and in the world of um, altruism. And while that is all great and, and you need, and, you know, more power to that, it's, um, it, it's, it's limiting in some sense. Uh, a lot of times you would find the projects that we wanted to take up in, in this mission, we have to kind of disrupt the media landscape. Um, would not get funding, would not be something that would interest, uh, would interest the donors, you know, uh, yeah. uh, who would be more in the space of, you know, women empowerment, which is great, but, you know, we also want to do more. Uh, it's not just that, look at these women who are doing these amazing things, let's empower them a bit more. So, which is why the shift to the company, because as a company uh, and as all of us taking the decisions, being the owners and deciding what, what we want to do, we can do that. We can we can decide what are the products we want to put out there that would question these norms, that would question these structures, that would speak to policy makers, mm -hmm. and would also uh, you know help us sustain ourselves. So I think that's where we are at right now with Chumbal Media, you know the mothership like we like to say to Khabar Leheria, where yeah. we're actively seeking out commission projects, we're actively seeking out uh, documentary projects, we're actively seeking out new media products we want to make. This is the podcast that should mm -hmm. be out there. That talks to rural youth about COVID or or jobs or unemployment or the prime minister. We want to make this product. So you know now let's find a pitch and let, let's write the pitch. Let's find a funder for it. So so yeah, that's the kind of. But yeah, it's I think it's always a challenge. We're always every six months going back to the books and and wondering you know if there's a gap and what else do we need to do and yeah. Okay, um, Daniela, do you have any advice? Uh, well. Yeah, very, very briefly, uh, very briefly. Can I ans answer with, with a joke? Uh, we, are, uh, we are sustainable because after five years, we are alive. We are, have nothing to offer but our work and our credibility. If it's useful, we will live on. It's enough. <laughs> it's all. <laughs> okay. Um, you know, there, there's actually one question, and I'm sorry I looked over this. Lucy, do we have time? Has anyone had, has, has, as smaller newsrooms, have you had to deal with defamation? And how do you avoid it? I can, I can speak to that really quickly. Okay. Um, in, investigative, in, investigative journalism, lawsuits are kind of par for the course, I think, and we have faced them. We've faced quite a lot of legal threats. Um, and we have, um, partly as, as being a, a non-profit, um, you can get pro bono legal support through that. So I think uh, we have a small budget, so that's definitely um, something which has been helpful. But also there's some aspect of, um, do you really wanna face down a community newsroom with, with a huge community around it, huge support? I think that's a real part of our power is that it doesn't look good to, to, uh, to sue the community news organization. So I think that's one of something in our pocket, in our power. Um, if we can print the story, if we can tell the, the community about what's happening, it, uh, that that's um, something that we can use to help defend ourselves. And the yeah, community will rally around us. And we know that we have 2,600 members, but we know we have a lot more support in the city. So um, I think that with that sense as well. 
And and finally, sustainability. I mean, because I know you're you're on your way there, but you're still grant funded, right? So yeah, we're about <laughs> funded and um, two thirds uh, supported through grant funding. And that grant funding is basically contingent on can we prove the model? Uh, can we prove that we can make uh, member phone uh, member funded reader owned cooperative news work? That's absolutely what we're committed to doing, and we and we're growing it. Um, but as uh, Danielle said, uh, survival is success. And we have been here for almost seven years. And uh, if you, what is sustainability in the news organi- in the news industry at all? So um, I think we are making progress, we are learning, uh, and we're still here. So um, that's the best that we can do for sustainability at the moment. Okay, well, that's great. And right on time, um, let's celebrate these three fabulous news organisations who, as they say, are still around. So thank you very much, Daniela, Puja, Lucas, um, for joining us. And I'm sorry that uh, Chris uh, didn't make it and will, you know, things like this happen. But there's a great story to be told about Devil Strip again Um, that we'll hopefully we'll be able to bring to you. So thanks again for joining us and thanks to Melissa for hosting the the Zoom. Thank you everybody for joining us. Okay. Thank you. See you. Bye. Thank you.